Is now a good time to invest in the Burr strategy, buy, rehab, rent, refinance, repeat. Interest rates are rising. For those of us that have been doing this business for a little bit, we've been blown away and impressed by how awesome interest rates have been for us over the last couple of years. We've had extremely low interest rates, which meant really good cash flow on rental properties. But what is that doing for rental properties today? What is that doing for new purchases? And especially, what is that doing for those Burr investors like myself? that bought a property before interest rates went up and how is that affecting us today and should you be getting into the burst strategy i'm going to show you a three bedroom two bath house that i purchased before interest rates rose and what has happened to me since interest rates have rent up and what did that do to my cash flow and did it make it a good deal or did it make it a bad deal and what did i do with it we're going to go over those things right now All right, so I'm Charles Yarber with Fixated Real Estate. I've done a number of these deals for you guys on YouTube. However, this is the first one I'm gonna show you guys where interest rates have skyrocketed since I bought a property. A lot of us are into the burst strategy, buy, rehab, rent, refinance, repeat. I myself am a recovering house flipper. I still flip houses, I don't like to admit that, but I still do it even in this market, but I wanna keep as many deals as possible. Flipping houses has made me a very good burr investor. Now. What has interest rates done for me? Is it messing up my deals? Will it mess up your deals? Let's get into this. This is a property that I bought back in 2021 when interest rates were super low. This is a three bedroom, two bath, 1300 square foot house in Tacoma, Washington. Look at this beautiful home here. You can tell the blue siding, it's been really well upkept. No, I'm just joking. The reason why we like burrs and why we like being really good at flips so we can buy properties like this and turning them into great burrs. Now you see this building to the right. We don't have a good picture of this in here. I actually own this house. This is a burr I did a couple years ago and I think I might've done a video for Bigger Pockets on it as well. We ended up buying the neighbor house, which actually after fixing this thing up will raise the value of this property. Now I wanna show you guys some of the before photos just to get them out, just so you guys can see how nasty it is. I'm gonna skip some of these outer photos here, but you can tell that the condition isn't the best in the world. It's an older home. It was built in the early 1900s. Right, but when you walk into the door itself and get into the front door, you could tell that it wasn't up kept quite nicely like we like to buy normal rentals. Now, for those of you guys that are normal landlords out there, a lot of you might not like this property because you would be a slumlord if you did. But us house flippers look at it and we see, hey, there's a lot of awesome potential in here if we can buy the deal for the right price. But if you're a Burr investor, you not only see the, a lot of potential for the upswing of the high equity that you can get out of it if you fix it up, but also the potential cash flow if you can rent it out and get cash flow to begin with. Look at that kitchen. So you could tell it wasn't well taken care of. In fact, somebody was living into the, living in this property until right before we bought it. The short story on this property was we tried to get this house for almost nine months, but it was in a living trust situation between family members. It took quite some time to get all the family members to agree. Uh, a family member was living in this property that a lot of other families didn't want to have living in that property. Uh, and it took a little bit of time for us to mitigate and help negotiate a deal to where everybody was happy. We even had to get the court involved just for family court stuff, no big deal. And then by the time we closed the deal, it almost took nine months from when we started negotiating a deal to when we finally closed it. So what does that mean? Let's go over the numbers and show you guys the numbers in all detail for what we can as much as possible. Uh, so that makes sense. So then we can get into what it means to be a Burr investor today and the interest rates and how they will affect you and how more importantly, they affected me. Cause that's all that matters, right? Ah, just for myself. All right, so let's calculate these numbers out. We purchased the property for $240,000. Now the neighbor house next door, we bought for a hundred and something thousand, but we bought that a little bit earlier and it was also super gutted. It was actually worse condition than this one, but we bought this for 240,000 and we bought it with the intention of making it a burr. 
We figured we can build the equity up. It would actually help the value of my property next door, right? So we were okay with the deal being 240. We knew it wasn't the best. We wish we could have gotten the deal for cheaper. We would have been happier at like 220, 210, but it was the only way we can get the deal was just to buy it that way. The Now, side note, why did we buy it also was because we knew no matter where the market was going, this was a great neighborhood, lots of jobs coming to it. We knew the neighborhood backwards and forwards. And no matter what happens to the market, job growth and demand are huge things to focus on in today's market. Where is the growth going? Where's the path of progress? This house is definitely right in the middle of all of it. So we wanted, we knew long term we were going to keep this property even if things weren't the best numbers that we wanted them to be because we're never selling this house. So we bought it for 240. Quick tangent, sorry guys. We bought it for $240,000. We intended on putting about $100,000 of rehab into it. But spoiler alert, we end up spending about $114,000 on the rehab. Now we thought we were gonna take a few months to get it done. It actually took a little bit longer. It took about seven or eight months. A lot of that had to do with permitting, some delays on the project due to supply chain. I don't know if you guys have kept up with the news, but supply chains have really messed up a lot of us rehabbers. So it took us about four months to get windows just by itself on this property. So that kind of sucked, was not part of what we were planning on doing. But nonetheless, we spent about $114,000 of rehab into the property. We held it onto it for a little bit longer than we intended. At the end of the deal, we thought that it might sell for $425,000. That's the after repair value, ARV, after repair value. Now, all those numbers alone, it made it an okay deal. Now, rental-wise, we figured we can rent it out for like $2,500 to $2,600 a month, right, if we kept it as a burr, and we thought we would get about a four to four and a quarter percent interest rate loan when we analyze this deal. Now in 2021, people were getting three and a half to 4% interest rate loans for even investment properties. So we thought we were conservative when we actually were, when we thought we might get like maybe four and a quarter interest rate loan when we bought this. Now we end up refining, we end up, sorry, repairing the entire property, getting it all done. And it ended up looking like this, bam, there it is, right? In all its beauty. You can actually now see the house on the right. They're almost identical homes. We owned this house already. We actually did the house a couple years ago. Uh, it took us a little while to get this house, as I mentioned, right? And now they're almost identical. This house is a little bit smaller because it doesn't have as big of a second story. But what does it look like inside? These pictures aren't exactly in order because uh, the basement is in there. It has a basement. There you go, guys. Uh, but the back of the backyard, it almost looks the same, right? But this upper unit is actually a little bit bigger than this unit over here. So uh, get a little bit more value. Almost did exactly the same finishes. They're identical for us. Uh, the house turned out nice. We put a new LVP. We always put LVP, luxury vinyl planking, into our rentals uh, whenever we can. We do upgraded cabinetry just to make it better. Uh, update the bathrooms, we do tile. We just want the higher value for the property that we can get. After repair value is very important to us on our burrs because we wanna get as much of the money back as possible in these deals. Some nice tile, everything looks good, clean house. If you're a tenant, you're happy to move into this deal, right? Hopefully in that market, turned a C-class property into a potential A-class property. So let's come full circle. You saw the house was a POS. You saw that we made it nice. We bought it for an okay deal. We intended on this property that we were going to keep it from day one. Even if it didn't cash flow that much, we figured we get most of our money back right at the end of the day. And we would actually maybe have only cash flowed a few hundred bucks. I was going to be okay with that on this burr because I figured with the way that the market was, when we go to get our appraisal, the after repair value would be high enough from the appraisal that at a 75% loan to value loan, we'd be able to cash out all the money we put into the deal and have no money into it. Even if I had five, 10 grand left into the deal, I'd still get an okay return. I'd be good on the deal long run. But did that happen? And it's now the time that you should be focusing on Burr. Well, I'll tell you what, right now, interest rates have gone up quite a bit, very high compared to what they were just a few months ago. When we analyzed this deal, I said that we're gonna get a 4.25% interest rate. And in fact, we did not get that. So let me explain to you guys what this actually means uh, as an investor. If you buy a deal with a intention, even if you're conservative, of being able to cash flow a certain amount and get a certain amount of your investment back 
after you refinance the property, get your takeout financing, that's what we call it, right? And those numbers don't pan out at all. Let's say that you planned on a four and a quarter and instead you get more like a 6%, which I'll go over what we had, right? And you thought your house was going to ref was appraised at a certain value and it doesn't. You have to make some judgment calls as an investor, of whether or not you cut bait and run or whether or not you keep the property and just deal with what is, right? So multiple exit strategies are what works out best in these scenarios. If this was purely a flip, then you just sell the home, even if interest rates rise, hopefully it sells for what you want it to sell for, and hopefully you got the rehab budget for what you need it to do, and you can make your money and move on, or cut your losses and move on. But if you bought this as a rental or an intention to burr, and you can't get the refi, or if the interest rates have gone up so high because the, and now all of a sudden your cash flow has shrunk, right? And also maybe your appraised value has changed a little bit, you have to make some judgment calls that are you in this for the long run, are you thinking about this only six to 12 months out? Or are you thinking five to 10 to 15 years out in real estate? Spoiler alert, long-term real estate always wins. Now I'm actually confident in saying that, long-term. Now what is long-term? Long-term is not 12 months. Long-term is not even five years. Long-term is 10 years or more. Real estate wins. Now I could be wrong, but I believe that full heartedly. So in this deal, do I believe that the market is going to be strong for this property 10 years out. I do. I really do. Do I believe with the way inflation is, it actually might help hard assets continue to rise? I really believe that, even if they keep raising interest rates. So if they keep doing that, what's the best thing that I can do to be able to mitigate my risk on this deal as much as possible? So first, I need to find out what do I qualify for on this property and is it worth keeping it on a math level? Real estate is math. Always remember that. And the other thing to remember too is rate equals risk. So the higher the rate on your loan payment, that means the more risky the investor, the, the lender sees your investment, right? The lower the interest rate, the less risk it is. That's kind of the way it works, right? So let me go over some numbers. Bear with me. There are a lot of numbers I'm going to go over here and hopefully we can keep track of them here for you as much as possible. So let's recap at the top. We bought it for 4240. We thought we were gonna, we, we, sorry, we rehabbed it for 214. We thought ARV after repair value was gonna be 425,000. So let's get that out of the way. Guess what? It appraised for $487,000. So boom, we are super stoked. It appraised for over $60,000 more than what we thought it was going to appraise for. Now on most times when you're doing a burst strategy, you think you're going to get a 75% cash on, sorry, 75% cash out refi. And if that's the case, 75% of $487,000 is about $365,000. Now for a lender, that would mean my maximum cash out is 365,000. But there's one thing we can't forget. And if you're not familiar with this, then this is something you should look up. If you're doing a Fannie or Freddie or conventional based loan, Conventional lenders look at you, debt to income ratio and your credit score. That's what they look at. How much do you make? Can you afford the payment with all your debts that you have? Plus also your credit score tells you your risk or your interest rate. Now, if you have too many conventional mortgages like, like myself, you typically go to an asset-based lender, a portfolio lender that's a community bank or other asset-based lenders that are out there. And they don't look at you and your debt to income. They look at the property. They look at the asset and they analyze that for risk. Now I'm gonna spell this out. They do a debt service coverage ratio. That's what they focus on, DSCR, debt service coverage ratio. Now what is that? That is how much is your rent in ratio to your debt that you're gonna be making your monthly payment on. That becomes a debt service coverage ratio. Your rent minus expenses gets your NOI. So that's your, that's your taxes, your insurance, your property management, all that great stuff. Minus your with your minus that from your rent, that's going to get your net operating income, your NOI, and then the lender is going to take your debt payment, your principal and interest debt payment, and they're going to apply that to your NOI, and that's going to give you your DSCR. So if I have a thousand dollars in rent and five hundred dollars in expenses before my debt, that means my net operating income is five hundred dollars. If my mortgage payment for principal and interest is also $500, then that's a one-to-one -one ratio or a 1.0 DSCR. It evens out. That means your mortgage, 
can't get paid by your NOI, but nothing is left. Most lenders want a 1.1 to 1.25 debt coverage ratio. So if my NOI is a thousand bucks, then and my rents are and my and my debt is a thousand bucks, that's a one to one. But if I need a 1.25, then I need my rents to be 1250, 1250, and my debt to be a thousand, and that'll be a 1.25 debt coverage ratio. So Hope that makes sense. That's a little bit of math, but that's what asset-based lenders are going to look at. So they look at two big things when they say, how much loan are they going to give you? What's your appraised value? In our case, it's $487,000. And then what's your DSCR, which is your rents? Where did we get screwed, <laughs> for lack of a better word? If we appraise at 487, then we knew that we can get a $364,000 loan. Great. Good times. Almost all our money back. Not all of it, but almost all our money back, which is cool. But interest rates went up, which means the principal interest payment also went up, which meant reflecting our rents, our cash flow went down, which meant our DSCR is getting messed up. So when we originally looked at this deal, we thought we would get a 4.25% interest rate. If we got a 4.25% interest rate, we'd have an okay cash flow. But the rates went up, I pulled some favors, I got lucky, and I was able to get a 5.625% interest rate loan for 30 years fixed with an asset-based lender. I could have gotten a little bit lower interest rate from somebody doing an ARM, an adjustable rate mortgage, right? A portfolio lender could have given that to me at a lower interest rate and had better cash flow, but it would have adjusted in five years. I don't trust that interest rates will be lower in five years. I trust that interest rates are probably going to still be higher or higher in five years. Therefore, I want a 30-year fixed loan, especially on a property that I'm not going to touch again because I'm going to keep it. I don't want to have to, every time I get an arm, I have to think about this property again in a few years. I don't want to think about this property again in a few years. I want it to just do its thing. Hopefully, rents go up, make more cash flow. So back to this. 5.625% interest rate loan at 30 years. Now our rents ended up being 2,600 a month. We probably could have gotten a little bit more. We probably should have pushed for a little bit more, but we got $2,600 a month. At a 5.625% interest rate loan, our principal and interest was $2,051. You also add taxes and insurance to that. That's another $343. So our payment is $2,394. That gives us a net income of $205.12. What does that actually do? Well, I can tell you that right now, if those are the actual numbers, then our max debt service coverage ratio for our mortgage on this scenario here allowed us for a maximum of loan of $356,000 with the current lender. So instead of getting 364, we got 356. So that's the final numbers there. 5.625, principal interest taxes and insurance, $2,394 with a loan amount of $356,000. So we got messed up by another eight grand. So we have to leave an additional $8,000 into this deal. Now, that kills some rate of return for us because how much money do I still have into the deal? Well, unfortunately, I still have $45,000 left into this deal. Why? Well, because we budgeted a little bit less and we spent a little bit more. Our holding time went up a little bit more on this deal, so our cost went up a little bit more. So I was left with a bill of about $45,000 that I had to leave invested into this property. What does that do for my ROI? If you invest, this is your cash on cash return. If I invested $45,000 and I'm cash flowing $205 a month, that's an annual cash flow of $2,461, $2,461 going into $45,000. So if you invested $45,000 and you're getting a return of about $2,461 a year, then my actual ROI is about a four, uh, sorry, a 5.3% cash on cash annualized return on that money. And I'll tell you what, as somebody that flips houses and has a lot of other rentals, that sucks. So. What did I have to do in that scenario? You as an investor, if you're in my shoes and you're going to get a 5.3% return on investing $45,000 right now, you have to ask yourself, do you keep this property or do you sell it? What would you do? What would you do? 
I hate 5.3% return. I know I can get a higher return. Not in the stock market right now, but I know I can get a higher return. Not in crypto right now, maybe later, I don't know. But I know I can get a higher return in real estate because of what I do. So do I sell this property and get my money back, get my 45 grand back, plus also, spoiler alert, the profit from the deal, or do I leave it in there and just wait? Well, I'll tell you what I did. So in this scenario, don't forget, yes, my money is a 5.3% ROI annualized for that 45 grand, but there's something called an IRR, internal rate of return. What about the equity I have into the deal? If you sent me a, a, a rental property right now and said you have to put 45 grand into it and you're going to get a 5% return, I'm going to pass on it. But if you said, hey, you got to put $45,000 into it and you're also going to have an additional $90,000 of profit in your equity if you sold the property and you only get a 5% return, I'd probably take that deal. Because right now, what I mean by that is if I sold the property today for what it appraised for, for $487,000, then after all expenses, I would get my 45 grand back plus another $90,000 in profit. So what's 45,000 in the 90? That's a 100% ROI. So I invested 45 grand to get 90 back when I sell the property, then I'm getting a 100% return on my money. But now if I keep this property for a few years, and continue to have it, and then I put that, and I'm getting that $2,400 a year, so I'm getting 5% on it, and then I go to sell it later, I might get more than that at 90 as well, but I also reduce my taxes. Because right now, if I flip this house instead, then I'm gonna get taxed on that $90,000 as ordinary income, because house flipping is ordinary income. But if I keep it and hold on to it for a year or two, I switch to long-term capital gains, and my tax, uh, my tax exposure reduces dramatically. So I'm gonna keep this property. So even though I'm a little upset about the interest rates rising, I still bought the deal on a decent level and it's still worth me leaving the money in it because where else am I gonna put the money right now? The market's kind of crazy. And I also own the house next door. So for those of you guys investing this in, in real estate right now, you gotta ask yourself, what if this happens to you? What scenarios are you going to run? What backup plans are you going to have? Are you going to be forced to sell the property? Are you going to be forced to keep the property because you can't sell the property? Do you already have a tenant in the property and then you realize that you can't keep the property because of interest rates? That's not a good situation. So the more that you, pro that you look into these deals and the more conservative you become on your numbers, not aggressive, if you continue to do what you've done in the past, and expect the same results tomorrow. In today's market, you're in for a rude awakening. Right now, anybody that's saying that rates are gonna be low again, they don't know what they're talking about. Rates aren't going low anytime soon. Right now, if you aren't projecting higher interest rates on your deals and expecting higher interest rates on your deals and padding that into your numbers, into your math, then you're making a mistake. So I'm Tarl Yarber once again with Fixated Real Estate. This was what I've done. I have a couple other deals like this that I've had to do this with recently as well. Thanks for tuning in on this. There's a lot of numbers here. There's a lot of detail. Ask yourself if you should continue to push forward with the burst strategy or buy rentals, but you're gonna need to adjust your strategy today in order to be successful. Get after it. There's plenty of opportunity, especially in the niches. Don't listen to all the naysayers out there. Make sure you figure it out for yourself. Do the best you can and kick some butt and we'll see you on the next video.